pretty good. All right, so yeah, I'm here to talk about Python services at scale. I work at Facebook as a production engineer. I'm actually on the security team, so I'll be doing a example uh, solution that we have for our PKI infrastructure. So the agenda for today, I'm gonna give a little introduction to what PKI is. This is certainly not a PKI talk. This is just a service that I've worked on that started from very small and has now grown to be very large, and it's all in Python. And the challenges that we've had to solve with this, such as building scalable and maintainable code base, trying to achieve a impossible 100% success rate, and being a good neighbor. Once you successfully become the Goliath in the room, it's really easy to squash other people who can't scale around you. So a quick introduction to what PKI is. PKI stands for Public Key Infrastructure. This is all about SSL certificates. If you've ever seen the little lock in the left-hand corner of your browser that says secure, that means this web page has a valid SSL certificate. And that's establishing a secure connection between that web page and your browser. You might not know this, but Facebook is essentially a company that is just a website. So having a secure connection to our customers is really important to our business model. And having an SSL certificate that is always valid, never expiring, is something that is huge to us. So when this service was started years ago, we were much, much smaller. We had a very small number of domains, a very small number of certificates to handle. Now, we've grown significantly. We have much, much more traffic than really we ever imagined this service would handle. So we've encountered a lot of challenges with this. A lot of things we hadn't anticipated that we're trying to solve now or were solved very recently. So I'm gonna give you guys kind of an overview of a lot of the things that I have seen that have been really important to taking a small service to something much bigger. The first challenge is writing maintainable code. Maintainable code means code that the original developer who wrote it if they're not the maintainers for the rest of their lives, someone else needs to be able to pick it up and maintain it after they've gone without potentially rewriting the entire code base. So I was not the original maintainer of our PKI service. I wasn't even the second maintainer of our PKI service. This has been going on for years, passed from developer to developer to developer. So how do we get code that different developers can start up on quickly and continue to iterate and design the architecture for? The biggest way to do this is to just avoid writing spaghetti code. If anybody has ever seen a spaghetti code code base, I'm so sorry. If you haven't, that's amazing. Here's some examples of what you have to look forward to in your career. So spaghetti code is some examples, similar pieces of code in multiple places. You might come across two essentially identical functions. Maybe they're even named the exact same thing. They might be doing the exact same thing. You're not really sure. Then you have to decide which one are you supposed to use? Why are they both here? This is very confusing and a common example of spaghetti code. Another example is circular dependencies. If you've ever seen an import statement in a function, this is probably because for whatever reason the whole code base crashes if you move this import statement to the top of the file. This is actually because this certificate module imports this module, but then this function needs the certificate module. So you get this weird, extremely confusing loop of importing, like no one knows what I'm saying because it's super confusing and this is not anything anybody wants to try to untangle. Now what I realized from working on a code base like this, the problem isn't usually that people are complete idiots. People aren't writing the exact same function directly below the exact same function over and over again. What the actual problem is, the architecture of the modules is terrible. So in this case, we have a bunch of random common looking libraries, but we don't know when to use which one. A new maintainer is not gonna know the difference between helpers and utilities. Like, wh what does that even mean? 
So this is usually what causes those last two problems I was talking about. Someone knows that they need to write a certain function. They think, oh, maybe it already exists. I'll look in the utils file. But it's not in the utils file. So they write it there without ever realizing it already existed in the lib file. So you end up with a bunch of these same pieces of code all over the place just because people can't figure out where stuff should belong. So to solve this problem, it's to write clear structured modules. Be specific with naming, or if you want a commonly named uh, file, just keep it to one commonly named file and everything else specific. So we took all of those different files, squashed them into one utility function, and broke out specifics into specifically named utility functions. So now it's clear if I want to do a database helper, I would use DB helpers. Everything else, utils. This is just a super high level overview of this general idea. I really recommend if you want to get deeper into this to read the Hitchhiker's Guide to Python, Structuring Your Project Blog. It's a super detailed guide like on how to design architecture like this and definitely recommend you look into it. The next example of spaghetti code, huge functions with lots of side effects. Has anybody ever seen this lint message before? Yeah, <laughs> ooh, it's not just me. Yeah, so if you don't use a linter, definitely use a linter. Linter keeps you and your team adhering to a single standard. This specific message is from Flake 8. If you write code that is too complicated, you get a little warning message about this. What we mean by too complicated is code that has a bunch of different branches of logic. So in this example, every if statement and every else statement is a new branch of logic. We have five different logic branches here. This is a very simple example, but you could easily picture how code functions can grow to be huge branches of completely separate logic flows. Once you start seeing that, you need to ask yourself how you can break that down into a smaller function. Usually different logic flows can become functions of their own. In this case, we're clearly trying to imitate a switch statement, which Python doesn't have, but Python does have dictionaries. So if you've ever Googled Python switch statement, this is what you come up with is usually a way to access the values based on the condition statement you would put in. So we've taken a branch of five different logic branches into a single logic branch. I know there was a whole talk on this yesterday, so I would just like to reiterate typing and doc strings. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with this function. This function maybe could be named a little bit better, but it's not, it's not wrong. But if I'm a brand new maintainer, I don't know anything about this function. I don't know what type of object cert is. I don't know what I'm converting cert to or from. I can't use this function until I read all the code in it and around it. But if I use typing, just from the function definition, I can find how to use this function. I find out that the cert object is actually a DER cert type, and I'm converting that cert type to a PEM cert type. So now, without reading all the code or digging through stack traces, I know how to use this function. Now, a lot of people say, awesome, I know what this function does. I don't really need any more documentation. But doc strings give you a lot more than what typing can give you. Obviously, they can give you details about the whys and hows of the function. They can tell you information like what exceptions it raises. If it's an API, you can show how you use the function. But more than all of this, doc strings give us the one thing that developers hate the most, and that's free documentation. <laughs> we don't have to generate our own wiki pages. We don't have to generate our own documentation pages if we don't want to. If we have doc strings, there are a ton of tools out there that will automatically convert all of your doc strings to usable HTML pages. Uh, this example I did using PyDoc in like a single CLI command. I created the HTML page that shows that my doc string as formatted documentation with links and everything. 
This doesn't look super great because I did it the easiest way possible. If you wanted to use something like Sphinx, if you've ever read the Python documentation, that's all generated via Sphinx. So if you like how that looks, you could use Sphinx to make some fancy smanchy looking documentation. And the great thing about this is as long as you keep your doc strings up to date, your documentation is gonna stay up to date too. So just to reiterate, Please write documentation. <laughs> I know you don't want to, but it's huge for future maintainers. Don't be this guy who starts a page that just says under construction, and then a year later, <laughs> some poor new maintainer has come to see, oh, maybe I'll find an architecture diagram. Maybe I'll find FAQs about how to debug this new service I have. And this is all they've got. <laughs> So please add documentation, maybe just a simple architecture diagram or explain some of the confusing hows and whys. It gets new maintainers up to speed so much faster. All right, now that you have some semi-maintainable code, the next thing to think about is adding instrumentation. Instrumentation is monitoring all the counters and metrics that you use to keep track of the health of your service as well as the health of the server that your service is running on. So the first thing I always am sure to do is add super basic counters. This is a failure one count and a success one count for every action my service is trying to do or every major task my service is trying to accomplish. If I have metrics as simple as this, I can easily come up with average success of my service, average number of failures. I can notice if there is any failures, if we're trying to achieve 100% success rate. This simple single line of code is going to be really, really important as you productionize. And I'll keep talking about counters and monitoring throughout the whole talk. The next thing to instrument is your resource usage. So you want to keep track, in addition to the health of your service, the actual health of the servers that your service is running on. A lot of issues you won't catch just from the health of your service, but you might find memory leaks if you're monitoring your RAM. You might notice why you're slowing down if you're trying to use more CPU than your box actually has. This kind of stuff will be really useful to you. If you don't work at a company that has this sort of pipeline already built in, there's a bunch of open source solutions out there. Uh, I recommend Prometheus. Prometheus is a huge, very active community. Uh, Prometheus provides client-side libraries that will gather the resource metrics for you without you even adding like export lines like this. Um, and they can take in your client-side service metrics as well. So look into Prometheus if you don't have a solution for this already. The next logical step from this is you want to graph your counters. It just makes it human readable. Someone can look at a graph and quickly see, yes, my service is healthy, no, my service is not healthy, or yes, this is looking like a memory leak, whatever it is. Uh, it's just human readable and nice. Again, if you don't have a service to do this, I recommend Grafana. It's also open source. This is not a screenshot of a Grafana graph that looks much cooler than this. I made this in Excel in like five seconds, so definitely don't look at that as an example. Uh, Grafana is pretty neat, and it'll take those Prometheus metrics and graph them all for you. So once you have these counters, once you have these graphs, you can start giving thought to your resource utilization. This doesn't mean go in and optimize every single one of your lines. It just means be aware of where your bottlenecks are going to be as you scale up. If your service is going to be CPU bound versus memory bound, that's super important when it comes to monitoring your service. If you know that maybe you're running kind of close to full disk on your service, you wanna keep an eye on those metrics at all times to make sure new code of yours doesn't actually push you over that limit and break your server itself. So just keep it in mind. Um, I actually have kind of a funny story. I was monitoring a service one time that was having issues. We noticed the counters were showing that the service itself was repeatedly restarting. So we dove into it, we said, okay, what's this up to? We looked at the server metrics and we noticed that the memory was slowly 
ticking up and ticking up and ticking up until the box itself ran out of memory, restarted itself to try to fix the problem, and the whole service went down. So using graphs, using counters, we were able to identify the problem. I went back to the software developers and I say, hey, looks like you guys have a memory leak or something is using up way too much memory. You have to fix it or else your service won't work. And they said, cool, no problem, we'll do that. Uh, but could you just tweak a config file somewhere to give us some more memory on the box? <laughs> uh, it's not really how resources work. I think a lot of new grads sometimes don't realize is that resources are finite. Even if there's other machines, I can't like make a literal pool. It is actually single servers. So just keep it in mind. Understand where your memory me utilization is going to be or your general resource utilization will be. So 100% success rate. This is really, really hard to achieve, but for a lot of services, it's necessary. For me, if Facebook.com ever lost that little lock box in the corner, I'd have a really bad day. So I want to try to get 100% success rate. To do this, there's three major things. Testing your service, of course. Rolling out carefully, because rollouts is where most issues happen. And, uh, and uh, monitoring alarming and on calls. So continuously monitoring, monitoring even as you're in production. This is my uh, beat a dead horse slide. We all know that you should be writing tests. We all know as long as you've tested things, you can be fairly confident your code is going to work in production. Unit tests are testing against your assumptions that you've made about your code. You assume your code should work a certain way, and you test that it does work that way. Integration tests test your assumptions. Often your assumptions are wrong, so try to run it with other services or everything all together, and you might find out things that you've unit tested have actually been incorrect themselves. And end-to-end -end tests, I'll talk about canarying on the next slide. Something that's easy to add if you don't have it, pre-commit and post-commit hooks. Uh, most version control systems have a way to do this. GitHub has plenty of tools around this. Pre-commit and post-commit hooks allow you to specify things that must happen when people push to your master branch. So say all of these tests must pass, or you must run this linter against your code, or whatever it is. These kind of pre-commit, post-commit hooks are just ways to say, as long as all of these checkboxes are hit, we're confident we can start rolling out or start end-to-end -end testing with this, with this new code. And the last thing is automate tests. Something that will hopefully happen is that eventually you've written your service so well and all the features are covered that you've entered maintenance mode. This means that you're not constantly pushing new code to your branches, which means a lot of times you're not constantly testing. But things can break, dependencies can break, things, assumptions can change over time. So if you have some sort of system that is automatically continuously running your unit tests or your integration tests, you can catch issues that you wouldn't have caught before. So we have tests running all the time, basically, to make sure things are acting as expected. Next is careful rollouts. This really matters, obviously, once you have more than one server. Your service has scaled to beyond just a single resource, so this is if We've got multiple resources. Uh, the first thing, of course, is create a plan and write it down. Most You want everybody who rolls out your service to do it in the same way. Don't let people get creative. Let's just make a plan and keep it written down somewhere. The first thing I do and what most people do is a canary. A canary is when we run our new code in production side by side with the code that was there previously. This canary, we let it run for a while, gather those metrics on it, and then compare with an like A-B style testing the metrics of our new code compared to the metrics of the old code. So if this new code is seeing regressions in the health of our service, or we're seeing regressions in the health of the server, we know to go back to the drawing board and figure out what we've done to actually make the code worse. So once we've monitored our canary and we're comfortable to roll out, Rolling out is kind of a, really depends on what 
your data center looks like or what you're comfortable with. A general gradual rollout plan would be uh, one server, 20% of your servers, 50% of your servers, 100% of your servers. But between each different step, continuously monitoring server metrics, continuously monitoring the health of your service. And if you notice any regressions, roll back and fix stuff before you roll to 100%. There's another way of doing rollouts. Personally, I do the gradual rollouts, but I've also seen uh, green-blue style rollouts. This is kind of interesting. You'll have the old code running in production. All of the traffic is going to your old code, but you put the new code on some servers that are not receiving any traffic. Then in a single go, you switch all the traffic from the old code to the new code. You send 100% all at once. The benefit of this is if anything goes wrong, you can instantly roll back to the old version without kind of doing some unroll like we saw in the last, ver in the last version. This is much faster to solve problems if problems do occur. So again, monitoring, alerting, and on calls. You have these metrics. You've rolled it out into production. Now you want to make sure it stays healthy in production. Once you have some amount of historical data, you can set he healthy thresholds for your service. You say, we never get below 99% success. If we get below 99% success, I want an alarm to go off. Or if my CPU utilization hits 80% of the machine, I want an alert and on call. That on call should not necessarily be you. That, <laughs> that on call. If you're the only maintainer of this program, you will get exhausted if you are the 24-7 on-call all the time. But if you have code that is well-documented, is well-written in a readable manner, any engineer should potentially be able to come in, see an issue, reference the documents, and solve the problem without escalating to you. So, this maintainable code, documenting your code, will make your life a lot better because you won't be the 24-7 on-call. All right, this is kind of the fun part. Once you're the Goliath in the room, you've made it, you can scale to crazy amounts. You can send more requests than you ever dreamt of. You no longer are your own bottleneck. Now your bottleneck becomes the services that you rely on. Those services might be internal to your company. Those services might be vendors. So once you start reaching this point of scale, you need to be sure you're communicating with the services around you. And that literally just means going and talking to people. I can't tell you how often this is a problem. What'll happen is some engineer comes up with an amazing optimization. They've figured out how to increase their number of requests by a thousand times. They run unit tests, it works perfectly. Integration tests, perfect. They run a canary, no regression at all. Things are great. They roll it out to 100%, and then some poor service downstream from them is all of a sudden receiving a thousand more requests per second than they've ever handled before. And they crash, then your service crashes. So if you're getting optimizations at this kind of scale, you need to let people know. The worst case scenario that I've seen is the upstream service will take up 100% of capacity of the downstream service, but they don't notice anything's wrong. They get all their requests back. The problem is every other customer that service is serving now no longer gets their requests handled. So your service, the upstream service, doesn't even know there's a problem until some completely unrelated service tells that service, which debugs and finds your service as the cause, which can take a lot of time, and you're now the bad neighbor who's ruining everybody else's picnic. So try to just tell people if you're increasing your capacity by any significant margin. Cool, so in conclusion, uh, write maintainable code. Maintainable code means that you are not responsible for this code for the rest of your life. Add instrumentation to your service. This lets you monitor your rollouts as well as monitor the production state of your service. And then be a good neighbor. 
once you're successful, once you're huge, you're not the bottleneck, your neighbors are your bottleneck. So be sure that you're not destroying their service for the sake of your optimizations. Cool. All right. Great. Uh, wonderful talk by Lisa. <laughs> Big round of applause. Uh, questions? Who's got any questions? I'll come to you right now. I'm running. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be the furthest person in the room, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. I really got a lot out of what you were saying about spaghetti code, and I was yeah. curious if you could expand just a little bit more on that, if you have any suggested reading, et cetera, et cetera. Um, oh, suggested reading is a good... I don't have any suggested reading off the top of my head, um, but spaghetti code, it's... Really what I find the biggest cause of spaghetti code is either huge functions that are changing lots and lots of things. So like I didn't mention, but I should have, uh, functions that change global state or change persistent state generally are super hard to understand and become really hard for a maintainer to follow. So as long as you're breaking your functions into smaller pieces, you'll be okay. I also think if you have an architecture plan in your head and you write it down, you can probably avoid a lot of spaghetti code problems because I do believe spaghetti code is generally an architecture issue first and a coding issue second because people don't specify what should go where and that's how things get all over the place or things get huge because it's not obvious that, oh, I could just use maybe a class for this or I could just use this module that already exists for this. So breaking it up, breaking everything into as small a chunks into pure functions or logic functions as much as possible um, will help you avoid spaghetti code at the end of the day. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. <laughs> uh, can you provide more information about the inst instrumentation? Like what software, what tool do you use? So at, at Facebook, pretty much all of our stuff is homegrown. So a lot of our tools are built from scratch in-house, uh, which is why I don't talk about them too much. There is publicly available blogs and stuff like that about Scuba, which is one of our data retention systems, and ODS, which is our counter system. I believe the best equivalent to us would be the Prometheus stack. It's similar in that there's a bus where you send all the data through, and then it's uh, can take that data, add it to graphical interfaces, and that kind of stuff. So I think Prometheus is what I would recommend for people outside of the company. Hey. Hi. Could you tell us a little bit more about automated testing at Facebook? Sure. So uh, we have machines that will just be dedicated to running tests. Um, there's also a lot of options and things that anybody could write, like a bash script that will run on the same machine that your production code is running on that just says, hey, kick off these integration tests and output a true or false. And then we gather those metrics of like true or false using the same kind of counter system. We can say, hey, this counter is always passing, always passing, always passing. Now there's a failure. You can write something like that just in a bash script and have it run on your server to check that integration tests are always passing for you. The new topic we hear today is site reliability engineering. How does mm -hmm. what you're doing fold into that uh, protocol? Uh, yeah, we thought we'd be cool and we'd name ourselves production engineers, but it's the equivalent of site reliability engineers. So production engineering at Facebook is the same as SREs. Um, and so I do work as a production engineer. Uh, we can do, in this case, I work on the code of the service as well as maintaining the service in production. It's kind of up to whatever the need is where some teams will only maintain services in production. Some teams like mine are more of a blend where we write services as well as maintain services in production. So that is kind of what a production engineer does, I guess. Uh, alongside the question about testing, I wondered if you could expand a bit more about how your team is using pre and post commit hooks. Um, sort of. Sure. Uh, yeah. So we have uh, pre commit hooks to make sure all unit tests are passing. We also make sure that people are. We don't force people to adhere to linters, but we do give warning messages like, "Hey, you're not passing all the linter checks. Please consider using the linter checks." Um, I think those are the major two things that we do for us. Black, 
Uh, so black is a Python code formatter. If anybody's ever used it before, um, I think there's a quote on the back. It's like as long as it's as, any formatter, as long as it's black. It's a cool tool that would automatically format your code for you, which I really like. Hi. Thank you for your great talk. Hi, um, I was wondering, one of the last slides you showed was about monitoring and thresholds. I was wondering, how do you guys determine these thresholds? And are they mm -hmm. dynamic, or are they typically static? Um, typically, they're static. Determining thresholds is a really hard part of my job. Generally, what I try to do is look at historical data and say, it's really a guesstimate until you realize, like, oh, I'm constantly going over this, but my service is still healthy. Um, and that's kind of how you adjust it. There's not a good way to say, like, oh, this service will fail if we hit this amount of RAM. It's generally a guesstimate. And then over historical time, you kind of adjust it to what you understand is the proper threshold of it. But if your service does start scaling, those thresholds will likely change. And you just have to keep adjusting and understanding where your service starts experiencing exceptions and where it's still healthy. Yes. Mm -hmm. hey, one last question. Um, so I had uh, kind of two parts. Um, first, so do you use any of the built-in uh, tools within Python, such as the logging module? And also, mm. um, a lot of the spaghetti code issues, I think, can also be addressed by process uh, so things like code review and that sort of thing. Yeah. Do you go ahead and, and what kind of code review do you implement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're completely right. Um, the well, sorry, what was the first part of your question? Um, logging. Oh sort yeah. Of thing. Yeah. Um, I do use Py the Python built-in li libraries for logging. There is some specific stuff for our Prometheus type stack that's outside of that logging class, but. Yeah, you should always have logs. Like, it, counters are great. Logs are going to tell you what actually happened, though. So just to be sure you always have logs. I do use the Python standard library logs. Um, and for your second question, uh, I'm sorry, code review. code review. Yes, we do do code review. Uh, that doesn't mean spaghetti code doesn't happen. Uh, we, yeah, we always require at least one person to have stamped your code, which I think is the normal sort of process. Um, but sometimes people don't have context on the code. Maybe if it's a brand new service and there's only one developer writing it, they kind of pull in like random other people who don't have the time to look at it, so they just give it a stamp, whatever. I think that's generally what happens when things start to go wrong. Or something is like, hey, we need this. Like my example, we wrote code in one place that really already existed. The person reviewing might also not realize that that code already existed. So it still kind of grows and expands. Probably the result mostly of laziness, but it still isn't a perfect solution. A big round of applause for Lisa Roach from Facebook. Thank you.